Hey, praise the Lord, it is I, Brother Clinton, once again, and you're back on the Word Prophet channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth, as our Lord Jesus Christ commanded. If you have your Holy Bible, King James Version, and you should, please open up with me to Matthew chapter 28. And I want to share with you something very basic, very foundational, something that is not taught in most churches that profess to be Christian, but is very foundational to the Christian faith. It's about baptism in the name of the Lord. So in Matthew chapter 28, may God bless the reading of his word. Let's start in verse 18. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. These were the instructions of our Lord Jesus Christ given to his holy apostles just before he ascended into heaven. And of course, as we can read in John chapter 17, he prayed, Jesus prayed, that we all may be one, not only the apostles, but also those of us who believe on him through their word. So the commandment that he gave to these men is given to all of us who are in Christ Jesus as well. So let's look at this. He said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. What does that mean? Well, it means what it says. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has all power in heaven and in earth, and that power that he has was given to him. Who was it given to him by? Well, it was given to him by God, his Father. God is the maker of heaven and earth. And God made his Son, Jesus Christ, the heir of all things. Because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the image of the invisible God. Because in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So God, the maker of heaven and earth, is in his Son, Jesus Christ. And he gave to his Son, Jesus Christ, all power in heaven and in earth. And at the same time, God did not give away all his power in heaven and earth because he is in his Son, Jesus Christ. That's why we read in the Revelation that John saw one throne and one that sat on the throne in Revelation chapter 4. And so when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be standing before the Almighty God. And the Almighty God has a body. That body is his Son, the man Christ Jesus. And so the, the, the men that were listening to Jesus speak these words understood exactly what he was saying. They didn't imagine that he was part of a trinity of gods because they were Jewish men and they were waiting for their Jewish Messiah to come. And he had come and so they knew the scriptures and they knew that God is one, not three. They didn't think that God was three persons. God isn't three persons. God is one and he has begotten a son and he is in his son Jesus Christ and to whom pardon me to his son Jesus Christ he has given all power in heaven and in earth god was in christ so this is why jesus said when you have seen me you have seen the father because the father who sent him is in him so this is why jesus said all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth and then he said go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in a name. What name? The name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Now, what is the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost? Well, the Bible reveals it very clearly. I mean, if we go over to Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when the New Testament began, and the apostles began to preach the gospel of the New Testament, they began to preach, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Those same eleven men to whom Jesus spoke these words, here in Matthew 28, 19, began to teach the people on the day that the New Testament began, which was ten days after Jesus spoke these words in Matthew 28. That's when the New Testament began, fifty days after his resurrection on the day of Pentecost. They began to preach, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. So, the Bible teaches clearly that Jesus Christ is the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's the name. The words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are not a name. The name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ. 
How do we know this? Well, we know it, number one, because as I just showed you from the Bible, the Bible teaches that. But if we break it down a little bit, we can see that the Son of God is called Jesus. That's his name. His name wasn't picked by Joseph and Mary. His name was picked by God and was sent by an angel named Gabriel who told Joseph that his name would be called Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. You see, Jesus is a name that means Jehovah the Savior. That's what Jesus means. It means Jehovah the Savior. So, the Son of God is called Jesus because that's his Father's name. Jehovah the Savior. This is why Jesus said, I am come in my Father's name. And it's written in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, that the Son of God obtained a more excellent name than the angels by inheritance. By inheritance. See, Jesus, the Son of God, got his name by inheritance from his Father, because his Father's name is Jesus. And his Father is also called the Holy Ghost, because we can see in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, that that which was conceived in Mary, the wife of Joseph, was by the Holy Ghost. You see, the angel spoke to Joseph, and he said, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And when God anointed his son Jesus Christ with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil, what did Jesus call the Holy Ghost that was in him? He called him the Father. He said, Don't you believe that the Father is in me? I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. The Father in me, he said it over and over and over. So the Holy Ghost is a term that we use, that we see in the Bible, which is used to describe God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is holy, and he is a spirit. So he is the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. These are two uh, terms that are used interchangeably, Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost. They mean the same thing. And so the Holy Ghost is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is called Jesus because he got his name from his Father, Jehovah the Savior, Jesus. And he is the Christ, which means the Anointed One. So the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ. Nobody had to explain this to these 11 men that Jesus was speaking to because they knew it. They knew that the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ, and that's why they began to preach just that, exactly as Jesus commanded ten days later when the New Testament began. So, the only way to baptize someone in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is the way that the apostles of Jesus Christ did so. They said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So, when we baptize someone, we don't pour water on their head, and we don't sprinkle water on them, because that's not a baptism. That's a shower. Okay, A baptism is when someone is submerged under water, and then they are pulled up out of the water, and they come out of the water different than they were when they went down into the water. That's what a baptism is. It actually isn't an English word. It's a derivation of a Greek word, baptizo. And the word baptizo in Greek means when someone takes a white piece of cloth, for example, and dips it into a dye solution with purple dye, and then when it comes out, it's purple instead of white. See, the cloth was completely submerged under the water and came out a different color. That's what baptizo means, and I don't mean to bring... Greek into an English conversation, but it's important in this particular case because baptism isn't an English word. It's a derivation of a Greek word. But we don't need to, to understand Greek at all to understand what baptism means because we can see by the scripture when Jesus our Lord was baptized. He was baptized by John. He went down into the water and he came up out of the water. And we can see several instances all throughout the book of the Acts of the Apostles where disciples were baptized and they were dunked down into the water and came up out of the water. Like, for instance, I'm thinking of the 8th chapter of Acts right now, where uh, Philip was sent to meet an, uh, a eunuch from Ethiopia. And as he preached Jesus to him, the, the eunuch said, Well, here is water, what doth hinder me to be, to be baptized? And they went down into the water, and he baptized him, and then they came up out of the water. 
That's how you baptize someone. That's what a baptism is. Sprinkling water on someone or uh, pouring water on someone's head from a jar out of, onto their head, that's not a baptism. That's not what the word baptism means. Because baptism is our burial. And the Bible says that baptism is how we are buried with Christ in baptism. Praise the Lord. So as the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The way that we call upon the name of the Lord to be saved is by baptism. This is how Paul, the apostle of Christ, was saved. Ananias was sent directly by Jesus to Paul, the apostle of Christ, and he said unto him, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22.16 So you see, baptism is how our sins are washed away, not by the water, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. What does the water have to do with it? Well, Jesus said, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So we can see people all throughout the Old Testament being born of water and of the Spirit. We can see at during the time of the flood, when Noah and his family were saved by water. Peter talked about that in the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter said that the, that the flood in the days of Noah was a baptism, the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. And the crossing of the Red Sea, we know that that was a baptism. They were born of water and of the Spirit. They went through the water, and then they were circumcised on the other side, and God made a covenant with them. And the same thing with uh, the crossing of the Jordan. They went through the water, and then they were circumcised on the other side, and God made a covenant with them at Gilgal. And all throughout the Old Testament, we can see God using water and Spirit in, in the salvation of his people. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus during the time of the Old Testament, it's written in John chapter 3, verse 5, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And so when the New Testament began, the apostles whom Jesus had chosen began to preach that same thing, this birth of water and Spirit, being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ in water and being filled with the Holy Ghost. That's the Spirit part. See, so when we are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins and we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, then we've been born of water and of the Spirit. And then if we follow on to obey God's word, we can enter into the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. So this is how Christians baptize people. We teach them about the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he came into the world and he fulfilled the law, and he died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day and ascended bodily, physically, into heaven in front of over 500 witnesses. And then, ten days later, he poured out his spirit and the New Testament began. And the disciples that were waiting there were filled with the Holy Ghost and they all began to speak with other tongues and prophesy as the Lord gave them the utterance, as the Spirit gave them the utterance. And then on that day, at that time, Peter and the other apostles began to stand up and preach, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall be filled, pardon me, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all those that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. This is the promise. This is the gospel. This is the way of salvation in Jesus Christ. And so when we as Christians baptize someone, we take them into the water when they've believed the gospel and they're, and they're ready to die to themselves and serve Jesus Christ because that's what your baptism is. It's a burial. Okay, You need to die before you can be buried. So if you're ready to die to yourself and live for Jesus Christ and you believe this gospel, then you're ready to be baptized in his name. And when we baptize people, we don't repeat the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We baptize people the way Jesus commanded in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. That's what the apostles did, and that's what we do. When we baptize someone, we take them into the water, and we say, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ, and we dunk them under the water. Sometimes we say, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But whether we say for the remission of sins or not, it's still for the remission of sins, because the Bible says that it's for the remission of sins. So, we baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. We submerge the person completely under the water. They have to be submerged completely under the water. That's how a person is buried. Okay, 
When you have a dead body, you don't bury it by throwing a couple spoonfuls of dirt on it. You bury it by digging a hole and put the body down in the hole and cover the body completely with dirt. That's how you bury a body. Well, the same way when we are buried with Christ in baptism, we must be buried under the water. So you must find some water that is sufficient to bury someone in. Okay, It could be a swimming pool, it could be a river, it could be anything. It could be just anything that's big enough to submerge someone under the water. Okay, Sometimes people use a bathtub. You can do that if that's big enough. Sometimes a bathtub isn't big enough. depends on the bathtub and it depends on the person. But the person must be buried under the water. And so we bury them under the water and we call upon the name of Jesus Christ for them because they're under the water. They can't call upon the name of the Lord while they're under the water. So we say, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. That's really all there is to it. We dunk them under the water and we call upon the name of the Lord. That's a Christian baptism. The important thing about Christian baptism is that we teach someone the gospel first so that they believe it. Because Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So when someone's being baptized, they first need to understand why they're being baptized and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then they can be baptized. And so once again, we just take them to the water, wherever there is sufficient water to bury them under the water, and we baptize them in the name of the Lord Jesus. We just simply say, I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we dunk them under the water and pull them back out. That's a Christian baptism. That's how Christians baptize, according to the Holy Bible. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen.